I'm going to talk a bit today about satellite altimetry in lecture four. Uh, Paul has already given you an excellent introduction to this topic. I looked at that lecture and thought, uh, rather than go through the gruesome details of the calculations, I would try to remember what it feels like to be a young graduate student. And uh, it's been a long time, but maybe I can still remember. And uh, try to think about what concepts were difficult um, and see if I can eliminate some of those for you today. So I hope this works. And if not, uh, then you can fire any questions you like at, uh, in the question period. Um, just to remind you, a satellite altimeter is something that measures the height of the sea surface. Um, a radar is used to get the distance from the spacecraft to the ocean surface and at the same time where the spacecraft is, is also very accurately located and so subtracting those two things gives us the sea surface height. Sea surface height at any moment is the net result of some mysterious thing we call the geoid and then tides, which you're familiar with, and ocean dynamics. Um, so I need to, unfortunately, spend a few minutes talking about the geoid, and that's always very painful. So here goes. Next slide, please. Um, now, Paul and I did our PhDs, uh, I won't tell you how long ago, um, in the gravity department at the Lamont Geological Observatory of Columbia University. And so we had an entire semester-long course on the gravity and geoid. And even then, uh, it was sort of a mysterious concept, as I recall first encountering it. Um, I'm going to try to make it less mysterious. Next slide, please. But before I do that, for those who are inclined to go to sleep when we talk about geoids, I have a little stay awake brain teaser here for you. Um, now, of course, in Hawaii, as we're doing this, uh, some of you have just rolled out of bed and had your breakfast burrito or fish taco or whatever it is that uh, that you have. Um, but here uh, inside the Beltway in Washington, uh, when we finish this lecture, it's going to be cocktail hour. So I thought I'd put a wine glass up here to motivate myself to get through the talk very quickly. Um, and as you may know, if you're a wine geek, uh, you tend to swirl the wine in the glass around the glass to enjoy the aroma. So for those of you who need something to think about, while we're grinding through boring things like geoids, I'd like you to suppose that you have wine rotating uniformly around an axis down the center of your wine glass, parallel to your local gravity acceleration vector, and ask yourself, will the top surface of the wine be parabolic or hyperbolic or something else? What is that shape? And how fast must the wine rotate around the edge of the glass if the portion of the wine near the glass wall is tilted about 10 degrees to the horizontal? There will be a quiz at the end. Notice the small thing in italics on the slide. Okay, so back to the geoid. Well, your experience of gravity is basically all you need to understand this. When you let go of objects, they fall. They accelerate in the same direction. We call it down. Water will flow downhill until it can't flow any further, and then it will puddle and stop. Um, it takes effort to lift things up. In physical terms, we describe the effort as work done against a force changing potential energy. Uh, the difference between vertical and horizontal is that vertical motions change potential energy, require work or, or recover energy, while horizontal motions can be done without any change in gravitational potential energy. And in particular, with regard to fluids, hydrostatic equilibrium uh, means that uh, fluids that come to rest, rest on horizontal surfaces, rest on surfaces perpendicular to gravity that we call level surfaces. The next slide, please. Whoops, uh, I'm sorry, I've gotten out of sync. Um, I beg, beg your pardon, I'm now looking at slide six. Everything I just said was talking to slide five, but that's all right, let's look at six, thank you. I beg your pardon. Um, I need to keep better watch on, on your video feed. So back to this geoid. The geoid is simply a level surface. That's a surface on which gravitational potential energy is constant. And it's that particular surface that represents the hydrostatic equilibrium surface for sea level, the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere. So if the winds ceased to blow and the currents ceased to flow, and we could get rid of the tides, the ocean-atmosphere interface, sea level, would come to rest on an, an hydrostatic equilibrium surface, a level surface, and that's what we call the geoid.
the shape of the geoid is irregular because mass distribution inside the Earth is irregular. Uh, but it's within about a part in 10 to the 5 of being a perfect geometric ellipsoid. So we use an ellipsoidal model as the model for the shape of the Earth and the model for the expected gravity field of the Earth. And then gravity anomalies and geoid anomalies are referred to that. A rotating homogeneous Earth would have an ellipsoidal shape and gravity field. Next slide, please. That's slide 7, right. So, um, just to recap about fluids, in hydrostatic equilibrium, fluids at rest uh, have their surface, top surface, a level surface. If you imagine the wine glass there as the ocean atmosphere interface for an ocean at rest. When the ocean is not at rest, when you have fluid dynamics going on, like in the glass on the right, things are different. And so the sea surface height that is measured by a satellite altimeter is not simply the geoid, but it also includes height variations around the geoid that are caused by dynamical oceanography. These are typically a meter in height at most, uh, height difference between the sea surface height and the geoid, often much less, and usually coherent over many tens of kilometers, except in very shallow water where the tides can be large and change quickly over short distances. Next slide, please. Uh, this geoid map that we've seen before really doesn't have much in it that looks like plate tectonics. Um, and the reason for that is that it isn't really the geoid that we want if we want to do tectonics with altimetry. Turns out what we need are spatial gradients of the geoid, and we can relate those to gravity anomalies. Doing this is going to require a little math, so bear with me. Next slide. Thank you. Now, I can't see well enough what you're seeing to find out what your equations look like and whether they look like mine. When you use PowerPoint, it sometimes changes things. Never mind the zoom in, thanks. But uh, yeah, I see what's happened. There's a little square box there, which means that a symbol has been replaced by an empty square box. Never mind. I don't want to walk you through the equations. Um, to do all of them, I'd need more equations than what are on this slide. But the basic point is simply this. The geoid height above or below the ellipsoid can be related to the anomaly in potential energy of the gravity field through something called Brun's formula, some celebrated 19th century formula that comes from a first order Taylor expansion of the math. Um, and relating it to potential is nice because the potential obeys a differential equation we call Laplace's equation. And that means that vertical derivatives are coupled to horizontal derivatives. And that's nice because the vertical derivative of the potential is, after all, the gravity anomaly itself. So we can get gravity anomalies related to horizontal gradients of the geoid or geoid slopes. And that's summarized in the red text there at the bottom. And that's all you need to know, never mind the equations. Next slide, please. So if we think about this, we can see why that geoid map is not useful for plate tectonics. The geoid is related to potential by Brun's formula. Potential is a vertical integral of gravity anomalies, but vertical integrals are coupled to horizontal integrals through Laplace's equation. So the geoid height at a point on the Earth is really a horizontal integral of, geo of excuse me, a horizontal integral of gravity anomalies over all the Earth. And in fact, uh, in that integral equation, which is called Stokes' equation, there's a term in there which is the weight given to each gravity anomaly as you sum them up over all the Earth. And the weight falls off very slowly with distance. So the, the geoid height at a point depends on gravity over a huge area around it. And that means that the geoid is a smoothing operator. It smooths out the interesting tectonic features we're looking for. The process of doing an integral amplifies long wavelengths and obscures the local details that we're interested in in plate tectonics. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that gravity anomalies can be related to geoid slopes. Um, the geoid slope is an interesting anomaly in itself that we call the deflection of the vertical. The actual direction in which gravity acts at any point, in which a, the direction in which a dropped object would fall, is perpendicular to the geoid. But the reference field of the Earth from which anomalies are defined 
has gravity falling perpendicular to the ellipsoid. And the difference in these two directions is an anomaly in angle, dimensionless angle, that we call a deflection of the vertical. And it's related to the slope of the geoid. It has components in the north, south, and east, west directions. Historically, it was measured with great difficulty on land by uh, astronomical uh, techniques. And today, it's very easy to get at sea with satellite altimetry. Next slide, please. Um, the orders of magnitude of things that we work with in this business are parts per million, and so I just uh, thought I'd uh, throw this up to remind us the ellipsoid departs from a sphere by about one part in 300, or three parts per thousand, or 3,000 parts per million. The anomalies associated with tectonics and solid earth geology are anywhere from one to about 700 parts per million. And all the other things that cause the gravity field to change, tides, uh, atmospheric things, fluid motions, all these other things are very, very small compared to that, and so we can ignore them. Uh, but we do need to deal with parts per million sized quantities. Next slide, uh, excuse me, next slide, please. Thank you. So we measure geoid heights conveniently in meters because the radius of the Earth is about a million meters. So a meter is a part per million sort of unit for the geoid. Deflections of the vertical, I like to measure in micro radians. That's uh, a circle would be two pi times 10 to the six micro radians. Uh, some people work in arc seconds. An arc second is a 60th of a 60th of a degree of angle. And uh, there are about five micro radians in an arc second. A geoid slope, however, is easily thought of as a millimeter change in geoid height per kilometer. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> ah. A geoid slope is easy to think of in terms of the height uh, change over the horizontal change, or a millimeter per kilometer slope is a micro radian, and that's why I find micro radians easier than arc seconds. Gravity anomalies are conventionally measured in milligals, and a milligal is also about a part per million of total gravity. And because of that coupling between horizontal and vertical derivatives in Laplace's equation, turns out that a one milligal gravity anomaly is associated with a one micro radian deflection of the vertical, roughly speaking. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, now, long before we were doing all this with satellite altimetry, people were able to measure gravity at sea uh, with ships. It's very difficult business and it's very error prone. And uh, your professor Wessel wrote the paper that is still the one I cite on the errors in the technique. But a lot of good work was done that way and is still done that way. And uh, that's important to us because we can use gravity collected by ships to verify the gravity anomalies we derive from satellite altimetry. Uh, the latest and greatest uh, gravity anomaly fields from altimetry agree with ships to a root mean square difference of about two milligals, which is fantastic considering the errors in the ships. I don't think we're ever going to do better than that. That long history of work with ship data taught us a lot about what to expect from gravity anomalies as far as what they can show us about tectonic structure. This graphic on the right comes from an early paper by Tony Watts. I can't remember which one. It may be a paper with Jim Cochran or Monik Talwani from the 70s. And it's a bathymetric profile across uh, the Hawaiian seamount chain near Oahu um, on the bottom, and then the gravity profile above that. And you see there's some correspondence with the features, but it's not perfect. Next slide, please. That old uh, work, uh, uh, correlating gravity and bathymetry, was looking at the number of milligals of gravity anomaly that correlate, uh, number of milligals of gravity anomaly per kilometer of topography that are correlated as a function of wavelength, which is a sort of spectral analysis way of doing things where you treat uh, topography on the seafloor is an input and gravity is an output and you ask what kind of filter takes topography in and makes gravity out. And the uh, answer to that filter is uh, what that filter looks like in different geological settings was all the rage uh, when Paul and I were students. And the uh, result of all that work is that we have found there's a correlation between gravity anomalies and seafloor structure, but it's limited to a range of spatial scales.
at the very largest horizontal scales, there's not much gravity anomaly associated with topography or tectonic structure. And this limitation, this diminishing of gravity at very long wavelengths, is something we call isostasy and is a 19th century concept in geology. There also is not very much gravity that you get out of a tectonic structure on the ocean floor at any rate at very, very short spatial scales. And that's due to a phenomenon we call upward continuation, which is due to physical law of gravity. Next slide, please. Here's a cartoon of uh, isostatic compensation. Um, the basic idea is that if you try to make a tectonic feature on the Earth bigger and bigger and bigger, and by that I mean larger in aerial extent, at some point it becomes so large when it exceeds the sort of characteristic bending wavelength of the tectonic plate, it becomes so large that the plate is not strong enough to hold it up and it will sink down into the mantle until it's pushed enough mantle material out of the way that it can be supported buoyantly, sort of like an iceberg floating in the ocean. So at wavelengths or spatial scales that are much longer than the bending wavelength of the plate, that's a few hundred kilometers, but it actually depends, it varies from place to place depending on plate strength. At scales longer than that, there really is not any gravity anomaly that is associated with the surficial tectonic features of the Earth. Um, next slide, please. The other phenomenon that limits the, the size of gravity anomalies at very short spatial scales is upward continuation. This is a consequence of Newton's law, and if I explain it right, you're going to understand it just fine. One of my great frustrations is that there's a NASA program manager who oversees these things who doesn't get it, uh, in spite of having a PhD in geodesy. But it goes like this. Newton's law says that the strength of the gravity attraction between two masses decreases as the square of the distance between them increases. Now that's right if the masses are concentrated at points, but when you have mass distributed throughout a volume or across a surface, such as the surface of the Earth, then the equation gets modified a little bit. It turns out the solution comes from a boundary value problem solved for Laplace's equation. And what happens is that if you can measure gravity right at the source, it has one strength. But if you measure gravity again at some higher elevation above the source, then the gravity amplitude has less strength. And the strength is decreased by an amount that is an exponential function of the wavelength of the anomaly, that is the horizontal scale of the source. So for example, if our source of gravity anomalies is tectonic features on the sea floor, and if the sea floor is on average about four kilometers below the sea surface, and we measure gravity at sea level on the sea surface with a ship or with a satellite altimeter, we will see not the true gravity anomaly of that feature, but an anomaly that's been attenuated by upward continuation for four kilometers up. And as you see in this graph here, if we put z equals four kilometers, it looks like on this graph, the attenuation factor is a half. That is, the amplitude is cut by about a factor of two. If the wavelength is about, or z over lambda is about 0 0.1, so the wavelength is about 10 times z. So if the ocean's four kilometers deep, we expect that at full wavelengths of 40 kilometers, that is to say, objects having widths on the order of 20 kilometers, for those things, the gravity amplitude we'll see at the sea surface is half what it would be on the sea floor. And if the feature is even smaller, the attenuation is even, le uh, even stronger, so that the available gravity anomaly is even less. Next slide, please. Now here's why it irks me that NASA doesn't get this. When we measure gravity with a satellite altimeter, we're measuring the way the ocean surface shape is distorted by gravity. We're measuring the geoid shape. We're only four kilometers above the source of seafloor tectonics, two and a half kilometers only at mid-ocean ridges. But if you try to measure gravity with a satellite in orbit by measuring the gravity field felt by the satellite, then you're measuring gravity at 400 kilometers or more above the surface of the Earth. 
And you can do the math from that previous slide that means that wavelengths shorter than 4,000 kilometers are cut in half. And by the time you get down to wavelengths that are not isostatically compensated, that is, wavelengths short enough to show us plate tectonics, all the signal is gone entirely at satellite altitude. So the satellite gravity missions, CHAMP, GRACE, GHOST, and so on, cannot see anything useful for plate tectonics or ocean exploration. And that's what I would like NASA to figure out. Next slide, please. So we have this theory that there's a range of spatial scales where we can expect to see a signal in satellite altimetry that is related to a gravity anomaly that we can relate to a tectonic feature. And uh, we've talked about this as being a sort of bandpass filter that throws away the very large scales and throws away the very small scales and keeps the middle. And I'd like to give you a sense of what that looks like in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Here we have uh, depths, uh, multi-beam uh, echo sounder bathymetric swaths from a survey made by a ship uh, somewhere on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I think this is near the, uh, is that the Atlantis Fracture Zone? I don't remember. Anyway, um, this is what depth looks like when you can survey it with the best possible techniques. Next slide. Here I've taken that uh, depth and I've smoothed it to remove the very short wavelengths that would be removed by a few kilometers of upward continuation. Next slide, please. Now here I've moved, I've smoothed it again, but I've smoothed it an enormous amount so that only very, very broad features are left. It's hard to tell in this color scale, but in the middle of the map where the mid-ocean ridge should be, it's about 2,500 meters deep. It's about the average depth of a mid-ocean ridge, maybe a little deeper. But way off on the flanks, on the far left and right, it starts to get from the yellowish green into the cyan colors, and it's getting down around four kilometers deep, which is the depth of the flanks there. So this is the very long wavelength part of the tectonic shape of the sea floor that is not, we expect from theory, is not going to be visible in the satellite altimeter data. So in the next slide, what I'm going to do is take the previous slide's map and subtract this map. So now the next slide, please. Right, we're on slide 23, bandpass depth. That's correct, thank you. Subtracting these two then, gives us uh, what we would expect from this theory is what a satellite altimeter will be able to see of the features on the sea floor. It's missing some of the fine detail of the abyssal hills, and it's missing the very large scale change that the ridge is shallower than the flanks. You see now that the bandpass filter depth is a quantity, it's still measured in meters, but it's a quantity that varies plus or minus something around zero because the overall depth two kilometers or four kilometers deep has been taken out by this bandpass filter. Next slide, please. And here is what the gravity field we determined from satellite altimetry looks like. It doesn't look exactly the same, and we expect that because gravity is going to feel some things that are under the seafloor in addition to feeling the depth. The biggest change in gravity is caused by changes in depth at these band of spatial scales. But if there are changes in crustal thickness at those scales, they will have a smaller effect on gravity. Also, I haven't tried to carefully tune the range of the color scale uh, in the color of the two maps so that they weren't, I didn't try to make them look exactly alike. It just turned out this way. Next slide, please. So to use satellite altimetry to do plate tectonics, we actually don't need to measure the sea surface height accurately because we don't care what the geoid height is. What we want is that the local slope of the geoid, the gradient of the geoid, should be accurate at length scales that are not isostatically compensated, that is short spatial scales, shorter than a few hundred kilometers. Unfortunately, the ocean's dynamic topography and the tide in the deep ocean are very small at those scales. They're, the slopes of them are essentially negligible, except in a few cases that we can deal with. And the reason I gave you that brain teaser about the wine glass is you're going to be able to convince yourselves that that's true. So if we measure the sea surface height and take its gradient, we're going to get the deflection of the vertical that we need to get the tectonic gravity anomaly 
without worrying about a whole lot of height accuracy things. These height accuracy things add hundreds of millions of dollars to a satellite mission cost. And you need them if you're trying to do global sea level rise of a millimeter per year with a satellite altimeter. And we do do that in my business. But we certainly don't need it for tectonics. Next slide, please. The reason they measuring sea level rise to a millimeter per year is expensive is because there are all sorts of systematic large-scale errors that enter into satellite altimetry. Uh, but we don't care about any of them for our purpose because they cancel out when we take the gradient, the horizontal slope of the geoid. And all we need to worry about are the random errors that are uh, from wave height. I, Paul, uh, Dave Sandwell and I have spent many years reprocessing all the radar data to do a better job of managing the propagation of those errors. I could give you hours of talk on how that's done, but I think you don't want to hear all that. Or maybe you do, you can ask. So we'll go on to the next slide. This slide was in one of the ones that Paul showed in lecture four and it caught my eye, so I wanted to say a little bit about it. I think if you're using satellite data, it helps just to know a little bit about how these things work. At, this, at the orbital altitude of 800 kilometers, which is where Geosat and ERS-1 operated, the satellites that give us most of our tectonic information, it takes about 100 minutes at that altitude to go around the Earth. And while the satellite's going around the Earth, the Earth is turning on its axis so that by the time the satellite goes from one equator crossing, northbound equator crossing to the next, uh, the Earth has turned about 25 degrees, and so the next track falls about 25 degrees to the west of the previous track. This goes on and on. It takes about 14.3 revolutions per day, roughly. You get that many revolutions in a day. You can tune exactly how many revolutions a day you get by boosting or lowering the altitude of the satellite. So it's possible to tune the orbit so the pattern the tracks lay down gives you something you want. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so almost all satellite altimeters that I consider the modern type, that is beginning with Geosat, they all have had a way of managing the travel time calculation of the radar so that the limiting, the thing that limits their precision is wave height on the ocean surface and not the electronics in the instrument as was the case with Geos 3 or CSAT before them. So since the mid-1980s they've all been equally precise instruments. And we've had lots of them in orbit, and so altogether we have about 50 satellite years worth of data on so-called exact repeat orbits. These orbits are tuned so that after a few days or weeks the satellite returns to exactly the same point. This is simply a matter of very precise timing of how long it takes to go around the Earth, timed exactly so that after a certain number of trips of the Earth adds up to exactly the same time as a certain number of rotations of the Earth under the satellite, and then the track falls on top of itself again. Physical oceanographers love this because it allows them to see the time-varying change in sea surface height. They don't have to worry about the geoid because the geoid's always the same if they always repeat the same track. And then they see the time variations in height and they use those to study ocean dynamics. It's unfortunate for us because those orbits have huge gaps in them. Almost all the data we have is data with enormous gaps. There have only been about two and a half years, a little less than two and a half years worth of satellite data collected in orbits that were allowed to drift so that the track pattern they laid down gave us a very spatially dense network of tracks. It's those that we need to do tectonics. Next slide, please. So in the good old days, Paul will remember this very well, uh, back before 1995 when the dense track data became available, uh, the best uh, data was to use the repeat track data, average all the measurements, hoping to average out the oceanography and get a clearer picture of the geoid. And so one did things like this. This is a, from a paper that Paul wrote with Bill Haxby on uh, the geoid and, uh, anomalies associated with fracture zones and, and uh, what you can infer about thermal stress in the tectonic plates from that. Um, we don't need to do that anymore since we have very dense track data available since 1995. Next slide, please. So this is what we can do with the data we have uh, today. This is, uh, as of a couple of months ago, our best attempt to reconstruct uh, gravity anomalies in the area. I'm going to say a little bit more about the, the fabric of this, uh, uh, this um, 
picture in another slide, but before we do that, I think we have another topic in the next slide, please. Now, I promised in the title of this talk to say something about resolution. And one of my goals in this talk is to give you a more sophisticated sense of what resolution really means. Um, the best way to look at errors is not to think simply in terms of precision or accuracy, but to check where are the errors larger or smaller than the things I'm trying to measure, and at what spatial scales does that happen? Because features are persistent across spatial scales. That's what allows us to recognize them in, in images. And errors can also be correlated across distances. They need not be independent of one another. And so to do the best possible job of cleaning up an image and processing your data requires understanding your signal to noise ratio as a function of wavelength. And if you understand that and can take steps to improve it, then you can design the best possible filters and smoothers and estimators for your data and you can optimize the resolution and it's that that's kept me busy for the last decade or more. Uh, we think our resolution uh, ought to be something like the sketch on the right hand side of this slide now where we can probably see a seamount that's about 10 kilometers in diameter at its base if we're lucky. Next slide. And that means that the very fine scale texture in these maps has something in it. You can tell that it's real if you look at these maps on the wall because you can see changes in texture that you recognize across uh, conjugate sides of an ocean basin or, or symmetrically distributed around a ridge axis. A lot of people don't like the bumpy texture in these maps because they, the bumps bother them aesthetically. They realize that they're too wide to be abyssal hills and uh, so it troubles them that the maps are there. They're, the bumps are too wide, of course, because of that upward continuation filter. But I think there's a real story in the, in the bumps because of their apparent distribution with tectonic features. Next slide. We've done a little bit of work on bumps and spreading rate. You may have already discussed it in class or you may be interested in reading about it. It seems that the root mean square amplitude of the bumps is uh, related to spreading rate in some way. And the orientation of the long axis of the bumps may be related to the orientation of the long axis of abyssal hills. Next slide, please. So one of my messages for you today is please don't blur the bumps. Uh, here's a little uh, story from a problem that happened a few years back. When Dave Sandwell and I uh, put out our, our one of our widely used uh, models of seafloor topography from satellite altimetry, uh, version 8.2 that came out in 2000. It was on a two arc minute grid and the sample points were on the odd numbered meridians, one, three, and five, and so on. This is what GMT calls pixel registered for those who are familiar with that. Um, other people took that data and repackaged it in products called DBDB2, eTopo2, and some others. And they reinterpolated our data onto the even numbered meridians, the 0, 2, 4. Well, you think, well, both of them are two minute grid spacings. They should be equally good, right? Well, afraid not. Next slide. When you take what is, what is called in the theory of sampling the Nyquist wavelength of that sampling, the Nyquist wavelength of the grid is a thing that has a peak and a trough in twice the sample distance, or four arc minutes in this case. And when you take something that has its peaks and troughs on the 135 meridians, and you sample it on the 024 meridians, you sample it at its zero crossings, and you get zero amplitude. So they took the shortest scale features that could be seen in the map and zeroed them out. This is shown by the uh, top uh, graphic here. And then the bottom graphic is a graph of the amplitude how they decreased the amplitude at all wavelengths. If you start in the lower right corner, which is four arc minute wavelength, that's that Nyquist wavelength for two arc minute sampling, you see the amplitude is zero. If you climb up that curve and you climb up to where they made the amplitude half of what it should have been, that happens at a wavelength of 20 arc minutes or five times the Nyquist wavelength. So the moral of the story here is when you take something that's given to you in one coordinate system and you reinterpolate it to another coordinate system, you lose an enormous amount of information. Please don't do it. Always go to the original source. Next.
sorry, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so, original source data. Well, the raw altimeter data are available from my agency and, and others. Um, Dave Sandwell and I spend years reprocessing these things. We've reprocessed a billion radar pulses, each of which is a nonlinear model fit, and each has to be done twice for reasons I won't go into. Um, there are some papers on that you can read. You can check the website for the latest and greatest gravity and bathymetry grids. Um, we're working with other national and international agencies on the bathymetry project, and the biggest improvement there is the new contributions of data that are coming in. JEBCO is going to be taking over this project when we can hand it to them, and they'll be maintaining it. It should be available through their website as well. Um, and there were new versions of both gravity and bathymetry this spring, and there's a new version of gravity crunching away as we speak right now. It should be available soon. Please check the websites. Next slide, please. So, um, I don't know if this has answered all your questions or been too much gravity or not enough altimetry or what, but I hope I've at least given you a sophisticated definition of resolution. Next time you hear people talking about their digital cameras, they're going to use the word resolution to speak of how many pixels the camera has. And how many pixels are in an image doesn't tell you how much information is in it. And remember that again, when you see a geophysical model, how many model parameters are in it doesn't tell you how much information is in it. When you see a gridded data set, the spacing of the grid doesn't tell you how much information is in it. The important thing is, does the feature stand out above the background noise? And I hope you've got a sense today that satellite altimetry can give us a bandpass filtered and sometimes noisy picture of tectonic structure, but you can find a lot in that structure. I think the next is the last slide. Next, please. Okay, here's my solution for the wine glass. When I made up this problem, uh, I was going with my physical intuition. It's always a good idea to develop your intuition for physics and then do the problem that way and then go and check the textbook and see if you ha are developing the right intuition. And it's always good to reckon the numbers in your head. Don't use calculators. Keep an idea. Get a, a back of the envelope or order a magnitude estimate whenever you can. My intuition was that the centripetal acceleration of the wine blob, the ratio of that, the ratio of that acceleration to the acceleration of gravity, would give me the tangent of the angle, the slope of the glass. Remember, I posed the problem as the wine at the edge of the glass makes an angle of 10 degrees with the horizontal. That was my intuition. To make sure I had the right physics, I went back and looked up the fluid dynamics because I don't do geophysical fluid dynamics in my head. It's too hard. Rotating fluids is an interesting problem. Well, to do that right, we have to assume that the wine, and I want you to assume this about the ocean. These, these assumptions are equally good about the ocean in this case. Assume that the wine and the ocean are incompressible, inviscid, uniform density fluids. And then you can write an equation for the radial pressure gradient and what you get is that this ratio of, of accelerations I mentioned, the centripetal acceleration divided by the gravity acceleration, gives you dhdr, the change in height of the wine with radius as you move out from the rotating center. And of course, in a small angle approximation, if theta is small, then dhdr is approximately tan theta. So my intuition that, it, that the ratio was the tangent of the angle was essentially right. Now, since dhdr is proportional to r, then uh, h of r is a parabola. And that answered the other question, was it a parabola, a hyperbola, or what? If the radius of the wine glass is about 3 centimeters, um, and the angle was 10 degrees, then I think this works out to about 23 centimeters per second, which is pretty fast. It means a drop of wine orbits the wine glass in just under a second. Now, we can do the same calculation in the ocean in two ways. First, we'll do it for a, a gyre scale circulation. This means a blob of water moving all the way around a basin, for example, um, uh, starting out in the uh, Kuroshio Current off Japan and uh, coming far north of Hawaii, coming over to meet North America, coming down uh, the west coast of North America, crossing back uh, to the west of the Pacific, uh, and then get rejoining things in uh, south of the Philippines and going up again, or in the Atlantic uh, with the Gulf Stream and going around that way. 
In that case, the appropriate scale is on the order of 10 to the 6 meters for r, and the velocities are very much less than a meter per second. The peak velocity in the Gulf Stream or the Kuroshio will be a meter per second at the center of the jet, but that's intensified as a western boundary current. The average velocity much less, and so you'll find the angle very much less than a micro radian, which is why I said that the dynamics of the ocean causes the slope of the ocean surface to be almost exactly the slope of the geoid. In the case of a mesoscale eddy, an eddy shed off of the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio, we get about three micro radians. I think that's all I've got. Thanks very much. Let's take your questions.